T-Mobile CEO John Ledger is set to leave the company in May. What does that mean for the company? Stay tuned for your daily charge. Welcome to the Daily Charge. It's Monday, November 18th. I'm Roger Chang. And I'm Eli Blumenthal. Let's get to today's headlines. John Ledger, the Firebrand CEO of T-Mobile, is bidding adieu. The company announced that he would step down next May with Chief Operating Officer and President Mike Sievert taking the reins of the company. Now, this is a big move considering so much of T-Mobile's uncarrier identity is linked to Ledger's brash and rebellious nature. Eli, what do you think? So as you mentioned, it's a big move. It's obviously coming at a very interesting time for T-Mobile mm -hmm. and the wireless industry. Yep. We have 5G, which T-Mobile plans to take nationwide and cover 200 million people on December 6th. They announced that the other week. They have obviously the Sprint merger, yep. which we've been covering Which very still closely. at this point is kind of in limbo. We'll see. Yeah. So it's a very interesting time to make the announcement that, you know, a, the CEO who has been so aligned with the company yep. is going to leave not long after this deal is hope you know in their opinion hopefully going to close now i think it's clear that this company needed to address it they were, they were getting questions about this back at the end carrier event just two weeks back uh, in addition there's all this chatter about john ledger going to WeWork, which he's officially denied right yes on the call today with with analysts and reporters he flat out said he's not going to WeWork. uh contrary to reports that circulated over the last week that said he was in the running and was talking to softbank who has a significant stake in WeWork about taking over. SoftBank is the company that also owns Sprint, yep. who he's obviously been working with very closely to try to get this deal across the finish line. He's not going there. Right, no, so uh, let's, let's take us through some of the changes. Obviously, Mike Sievert, who's been around for a while, he's been around throughout this entire carrier uh, run over the last several years, uh, is taking over as CEO, but there were some other personnel changes? Yeah, so Mike Sievert uh, is being bumped up from COO to CEO. Yep. Now with this move, he's already president. He's going to remain president. Uh, Ledger's remaining on the board. He's not going anywhere. Braxton Carter, uh, one of Ledger's lieutenants, is going to also stay around at least until, I believe, July is when they said. And he's the chief financial officer right yes. now. Yep. And he's he's hanging around uh, at least, I believe, until July is what they said. Uh, Neville Ray, who's been the CTO, is now bumped up to president of technology. What exactly that means? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Isn't necessarily clear. Maybe he just gets more money. I'm assuming he's doing the same thing. It could be. <laughs> and Neville, by the way, for for additional context, he's the one that really kind of pushed out the super fast rollout of their 4G network, and he's doing that now with the 5G. He's network. He's the network guru. He's yep. the guy who's yep. completely redone. You know, obviously in conjunction with other talented members of their team, right. but he's completely redone their network and really done a very impressive job right. building it up from the reputation that they had years ago to a much stronger, more viable network that it is today. And so the big question here, uh, you know, going back to Ledger's kind of brash nature, Mike Sievert, who, you know, I've dealt with for a long time, we've both dealt with for a while, he's definitely not John Ledger. He's a bit more buttoned up. He's a bit more straight-laced. Um, very smart guy. But, you know, whenever you're going from a company that's run from a colorful character like Ledger to uh, someone who's a bit more straight-laced, like Mike, like, what do you think? Is that is that going to have a fundamental change in the company and the way it's run? I can't imagine it won't. Uh, both are well-known industry uh, veterans. Right. Uh, Sievert was also at AT&T, just like Ledger was. Yep. I believe he was also at Clearwire. And, and a Microsoft few, for a little Microsoft while. Microsoft as yep. well. Yep. Um, definitely different personalities between Ledger and Sievert. But, you know, they're talking about T-Mobile keeping this, you know, whatever's been working, not breaking right. that. Right. So... I can't imagine they're going to get rid of all their things like T-Mobile Tuesdays or, you know, taking shots at the competition. That's very much a part of the brand at this point. <laughs> right, right. It just may not be Ledger doing, you know, firing those guns. Absolutely. Uh, elsewhere in the news today, Google Stadia is set to launch tomorrow, but that doesn't mean there isn't a time for last minute change of plans. Uh, this is good news, though. Google said last night that it is adding 10 new games to its lineup, bringing its total to 22. These are titles like NBA 2K20 and Rage 2, which were supposed to come later, but now they've been moved up to the launch time. Now, Eli, what do you think of say? What do you make of this? This is launching very soon. Um, these ad these new titles, is this just Google trying to like up the ante, try to get folks to you know give them an extra incentive to join? Very much so. I mean, Google had a launch list of, I believe it was 12, 12 games. 12 initially, yeah. That's an incredibly small list. And a lot of the games were older games too, right? I think uh, the Assassin's Creed Odyssey was one of the, the headline games, but that was a... That's a pretty right, old Destiny game. Right, Destiny 2. All these games yep. have been around for a while. The people who are probably interested in Stadia were already playing them yep. on a PlayStation or a PC or an Xbox. So you got to give people a reason to make this switch to Stadia. 
this makes it a little bit better, but it's still very much an early stage. It definitely. I think it feels like it, it arrives with a lot of questions, right? This is a like a, a system that requires an internet connection at all times, which means if you're in a dead zone, you, you can't play. There's no offline pl play. You have to pay a monthly subscription for the service as well as full price for these games. So there's a lot of... There's a lot of barriers to entry here, right? Not to mention the fact that if you want to play, you know, on your Android phone, which is one of the big tenants of this platform, yep. you got to be mindful of data caps. Yes. Unlimited subscribers generally have about 22 and a half gigabytes of data a month. If you're playing at 4K, right? how fast is that going to go through? That's another thing to keep an eye on. And once we get to the 5G world, I mean, that, that data is going to get consumed super quickly, right? Presumably. So yeah. it's, it's all the more reason to, uh, I guess, more stay tuned to Stadia, but... I'm definitely. sure we'll have more on that before it launches We're tomorrow. definitely going to have more on that uh, for the, throughout the week, so stay tuned. Uh, so what do you all think? It's time now, as always, to check in with our live audience to keep the conversation going. How will Ledger's departure affect T-Mobile as a company? Does Seabird have the right charisma to fill such big shoes? And are you getting Stadia? We want to know from our gamer audience and what games in the lineup have you most excited. So keep us posted on your gameplay experience. Brian, what's on their minds today? I just want to say that before we go into too deep of a conversation, we talk about this uh, transition from John Ledger to Mike Sievert, and all I can think in my head is this mirrors a lot outside of truly devastatingly unfortunate circumstances of Tim Cook, uh, yeah. Steve Jobs yeah. transition. Is it not? What do you, I mean? Yeah, I mean, excluding the actual circumstances behind that actual transition, yeah, like Steve Jobs was a very charismatic, colorful um, and he was, you know, he's kind of a dick sometimes. He was a very, uh, he was a strong personality, massive amounts of charisma. And then, you know, to go from that to Tim Cook, uh, who's definitely more of an operations guy, uh, definitely uh, less with sort of the, the massive innovative vision. Um, but you know what? Apple is at, you know, an all time high right now. And, and Tim Cook has steered this company pretty well over the last it, decade. So, you know, beyond now the iPhone, Tim Cook. Yes. And, AirPods. Right. AirPods, is, <laughs> AirPods have been a particularly uh, strong thing for Apple, but so services, watch. Yes. They, they've done a number of products post jobs in this Tim Cook era. And Sievert, you know, is, is entering an era with T Mobile with 5G. Right. That's just as wide open. I mean, they have, they're going into television. They yep. have T Mobile TV, which is supposedly coming out next year. I think that's what they, they were talking about uh, last year. They announced yeah. it earlier yeah, yeah. this year. They're, they're, still, they're still talking about it. They're, they're looking into home broadband with 5G. They have a lot of different areas they're playing in that Sievert has plenty of opportunity to make his mark in. And in, like Cook, I think Sievert is it's really good about execution. He's really good about you know making sure that the train's running on time. I mean, he you know he and Ledger have worked together the last several years to kind of build up the Uncarrier brand. John may have been sort of the the vocal the the mouthpiece yeah. for Uncarrier, but you know Sievert was there throughout the entire journey. Yes, yeah, Sievert Sievert was right alongside, and in recent years has been, you know, featured yeah. alongside John, yes. seemingly telegraphing this this move that this was happening. I mean, was it two weeks ago? He was in the webcast right alongside John. Yep. It wasn't John doing yep. a stand-up monologue. It was, you know, a little pass back and forth. Definitely. The last the couple of Uncarrier events, it was notable how much time they gave to Siebert to, to get up and sort of talk about the specifics of the programs. So, for sure. All right, Brian, what, what else we got? We got a lot of conversation from uh, Tim and Yan, who are very excited to talk about Stadia. We're going to stay focused on Ledger for just a second, though. Uh, I doubt the new CEO will be as outspoken as John Ledger. What will happen to that uncarrier movement? I mean, that's a really good question. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the multi-billion dollar question in, in, facing T-Mobile right in now. In terms of what they'll be able to do, I suspect that it'll be somewhat similar. I think they'll they'll try to go for... They've been really good at identifying the pain points. I like to say pain points a lot. The annoyances uh, with the carrier with wireless service and sort of going after it, you know, with the, with the latest one offering you know free service to first responders for a decade. This was an instance where they didn't have a huge business here, but their rivals AT and T and Verizon too, and AT and T specifically. And so by like targeting a business that they didn't really have, it really kind of hurt hurt their rivals more than it you know than it hurt themselves, right? Yes, very much so. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, in addition to that, they're going after, you know, some low-income customers. Yep. With that, with the, the $15 plan? The $15 plan, yep. but also bridging as what it's been called the homework divide mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by offering 100 gigabytes a year 
in data to low-income users. 10 million households with children, yep. So they, there's definitely, again, more opportunity there for them to do a lot of different things. And T-Mobile has really built itself on this uncarrier brand, and Ledger has done a great job of getting all of his lieutenants to embrace the pink. And they, <laughs> Magenta. Magenta, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't see that changing anytime soon because, again, it's, it's you know, if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I will confess my disappointment in, in uh, Ledger departing. That means less F-bombs and less <laughs> less obscenities on conference calls, which is a nice change of pace when Some you listen to conference calls. Some of which directed at you. Some of which have been directed at me, which... Um, I'm, I'm all for. I'm cool with that. <laughs> uh, next question is, uh, what about the timing for this announcement? It's right after the WeWork findings and the merger. Yep. Are we missing something here? Was this was this maybe orchestrated from before? Uh, look, I think that they've been getting a lot more questions about it. Uh, you know, John and Mike were asked about it uh, at the since Uncarrier the event. Well, since the merger, but since really the in announced. the Uncarrier event just two weeks ago, you know, there yeah. were questions about it. Um, you know, it was still kind of a sensitive topic. But they were addressing it. And I think John has been over the last year or two really kind of been trying to push up some of his, the other team members beyond Mike. And that's just shining a further light on, you know, right. why is he why is he doing this? Nothing that John Ledger does is seemingly by, you know, coincidence. Right. Everything right. has a reason. Everything has a plan. Yep. He's showing off more of his lieutenants, whether it's Sievert or Neville Ray. Right. There's a reason why he's doing that. They had guys like Mike Katz on. He talks about Cali Field, their customer service. Head. Like, He's been in his interviews. He's been referring to these other executives more and more, and really trying to emphasize the fact that they've got a deep bench. And this has really been—he's been really setting the groundwork for this for a while. Yes, and that's yeah. you know what we've seen at other companies when there's about to be a transition of leadership, is you you make sure that <coughs> investors and, and customers, stakeholders know that there is more to the company than just the outspoken CEO. And I think, look, the timing of this has—I mean, it has to be with the WeWork stuff, right? The rumors are flying. Um, and yeah, they, they denied it, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, he went out and, you know, technically there were reports that he went out and interviewed for this job, or at least talked about the uh, possibility of this job. Um, that leaves a lot of uncertainty for a company. So uh, to basically make sure that there was a clear plan in place, they, they had to hold this call because they had to basically address investor concerns that there might be a leadership shift. And clearly there is one now. Yeah. And his contract was up, or I guess is up yep. April 30th. And that's no knowledge. Um, again, so just going on your point, there's something that they just had to address right. and then laying this, you know, hangover while they're trying to close this deal, while they're dealing with the multiple state attorneys general yeah. who are trying to block their deal, right. just having this whole, you know, air of uncertainty overhead. That's just too much to deal with. It's not worth it. Yep. Let's shift gears over to Stadia. Uh, some say Stadia will fail due to Google's history, but what will happen to the console war if they succeed? It was it, it, the console war. Is that still really going on? Like, uh, not not I mean, like yeah, it was in the it, '90s. Well, I mean, and I watch it, a lot of documentaries on the Sega it, Genesis. I mean, it's you. still for 2019. It's not yeah. really much of a war. PlayStation's kind of had this thing won for a while. Well, Microsoft's been... technically the Switch is the best-selling one, right? Yes, but in this generation, it, yeah, got it. It's yeah, been, yeah, it's been Sony. Microsoft's been very strong. Switch has been very strong. Right. Stadia is not going to, no, in it, my opinion, shake that up. No, but it, it may over time. Like this is this is definitely a longer term play for Google. And you know, if Google's got a lot of resources, so they could probably stay in this area for a while. They could they could afford to lose money on this for for a long time. And this is a long term play because I think eventually, this is probably the model for how you will get games. Just not now. It just it, it isn't quite ready yet. I don't think the infrastructure is quite ready yet. Um, well, 2020 is going to be a really interesting time for video games. While this generation of the console wars is over, the next one, as you know, we've mm -hmm. talked about here before and covered online before, is just getting started. Yep. We yep. have the next Xbox coming next holiday. We have the PS5. next PlayStation coming sure. next holiday. We have Apple Arcade, we ha which has we been We also growing. have rumors of you know Switch up uh, overhaul, right? Yeah. So. Every 2020 Every, holidays should be a lot of fun. For yeah, gamers. it should be a really big year for physical console games. That doesn't mean this cloud gaming stuff is going to go away. I think it is the future, but uh, we're, we're at this point, I think it's just, it's really for early adopters. It's really for kind of planting a flag in this area and, and kind of building the service up over time. Cause I, I, I don't take the stance that it's going to fail uh, by any means. I just don't think it's, it's going to take a while, much longer than anyone thinks for this to kind of take off. Yes. And to a point you mentioned earlier, a lot of the games that Google's launching Stadia with are very much old games. Yeah. Even yeah. NBA 2K20. 
is but I would say, a game that came out in September. Right. I would argue that that might be a smart move on their part, getting something that's established, installed, and maybe not as buggy as something that's new and in development. They want to make sure to have a soft and safe 100%. foundation, and I think that's that's a smart move on yeah, their part. Right, and next year it will be very interesting to see when we reach the these new titles coming to the Xbox, whatever that's called, the next Xbox, and the PlayStation 5. Do they also have a concurrent launch on Stadia? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do we think that Stadia is really about appealing to console gamers, or does it uh, really kind of land more on the sake of PC gaming, or is it some weird hybrid that's somewhere in the middle? Because we both we all know that beyond the console wars, there there's a PC elite crowd. So I think for now it's it's going more towards console. Just my two cents on on from where I've seen it positioned. Yeah, it seems like they're not going after the PC gamer. That's a different type of audience. Um, that's an audience that's a lot more elite. Uh, what was that <laughs> elite? Well, they have higher I, I standards, right? They have higher exactly. standards. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, and as you just mentioned, uh, BBG, it's they're very much trying to cushion this launch. They're taking titles that you know, granted, they're now at twenty-two, so they just added ten, which is great. But it's titles that are older titles, or titles that like, they that, that games that, that the elite can optimize. Game, their elite gamers have probably already played too. Right. right. So they're not going for uh, anyone who again wanted to play Destiny Two or Assassin's Creed or NBA Two K. They've already played it. Right. They they weren't waiting for Stadia. Most of them to to get those games. I mean, they're likely not going to come anywhere near competing with the big boys that are out there right now. But they're getting their foot in the door, and that's interesting. You have to start somewhere. Exactly. Uh, what is exactly the advantage of Stadia? If you already have to buy the games, it just kind of seems pointless to get essentially a Game Pass service here. Yeah, and look, I think the the benefit is the ability to play it onto multiple devices. Like play it anywhere. You, you play so it you anywhere. Can, you play it on your Android phone. You could play it on your your TV with a Chromecast. Play it on your uh, laptop. You could play exactly. it on a tablet. You don't you don't need to own a physical console. That is the benefit. Keep in mind, like to pay for this benefit, it is pretty steep. You've got the monthly subscription charge. Uh, was it ten dollars a month? I believe something like that. I think so. And then on top of that, you have to pay full price for the game. So you're basically paying for this luxury, and a luxury that may or may not work so well depending on whether or not, like, particularly for how phones. stronger connection is. Yes, particularly for your phone. If your reception is not great, that service is unusable. So, like I said, this is this is getting the foot in the door. It's it's early days. I think they're just trying to set this as a potential model for where this can go for the future, but. I don't think it's super practical for a gamer right now to invest in. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's very much a first step. Unless you've got a lot of disposable income, then right. you know. But the cool. appeal the appeal is great, and it's something Microsoft's experimenting yep. with with X Cloud. X-Cloud, sure. Granted, they're in a preview stage right now with I believe fifty titles. Right. So you know. I mean, it's future proofing. Uh, never underestimate uh, underestimate the power of laziness either. Uh, half the movies I own on DVD are on other streaming platforms like Netflix, but that means I don't have to get up and walk over to the case and pick it up and put it in the player. And never underestimate the power of a company with seemingly unlimited funds like Google entering a space. Right. Preach. They, right. they have a yep. lot of resources to make sure this thing works. Absolutely. Yan is very excited. One of the features I think Stadia stands out the most, at least theoretically, is that MMO capability. This coupled with the integration mm. from YouTube will introduce a whole new type of gaming streaming where fans can join on in. That would be fun, too. That's a great point. I, I've, I've never experimented with MMOs much myself, but I understand the appeal. Uh, watched a lot of League of Legends online, <laughs> so let's see where that takes us. It'll be interesting <laughs> if Google can actually recruit somebody like a, a League of Legends type of game. Hmm. to their platform yeah yeah I mean, they smart. notably that from would mmo standpoints they don't have you know a lot of them at this initial launch phase yeah they don't have fortnite for example and that's that's going to be a big you know outlier this holiday season especially yes. because fortnite mania fortnite mania is still very much a and thing. it is everywhere else that's and it thing. is very much everywhere <laughs> else you can get it on your android phone you just right. can't get it through stadia right are there any updates on the Stadia controller? They were supposed to work with Wi-Fi, but it seems like it's going to need to connect to the controller uh, to like the actual operating system, whether it's a TV or whatever PC, uh, using cables. Do we know if they got wireless capabilities coming or not? Uh, I don't know. I'm not aware of that, but yeah. we will have full coverage of Stadia this week yeah. on CNET.com. Stay tuned. We're, we're, so with, the la- with the launch tomorrow, you can expect us to have a full blitz of Stadia coverage throughout the next couple of days. hopefully that answer. Yeah. Uh, Timothy asks if they might unveil some sort of like PS4, Xbox, Switch trade-in program for Stadia. I don't know if that's huh. anywhere near uh, possible, at least from a fiscal standpoint, but I am interested to see 
if you are a pre-existing gamer out there, if the Stadia is enticing enough to you to think that it might pull you away from actually buying more hardware in the future. Uh, I don't know. I think it's harder to market because it just comes off as a community where the others can really boast more of the technical specs. Now, I get that Stadia has outstanding specs too, and like the idea, the theory that unlimited 1080p streaming is at your fingertips is pretty powerful. Let's see how well it works, right? Yeah. I mean... And a trading program would make sense, especially again as we approach 2020, and people are, you know, the the market that Google's trying to court is looking to buy a new console. That's right. a wide right. open market that they can try to attract by saying, "Hey, give us your old Xbox One or PlayStation 4, and we'll give you a whatever type of discount on Stadia." You know, that would make sense if you were able to, you know, turn in your Mortal Kombat 11 and like get the free version on Stadia. But I don't, right now, I don't believe there are any trade-in programs for this. Right, I don't uh, think there is one. Either. But, like, if you've already invested in these games, then, I, yeah, like, it it doesn't make sense to give them up unless there is some sort of, like, reciprocal uh, give back to it, right? Like, if you've got Red Dead Redemption 2, and you're like, well, I, I really love this game. Are you going to make me whole if I, like... Well, not to mention if you're playing a game like that, yeah. you know, all your progress... And yeah, just, it gets wiped, right? Right. Yeah. So there has to be a way to sync that across different platforms, which yep. we're getting progress as far as, you know, cross-platform right. compatibility, but I don't think we're there yet. Right. Like achievements don't carry over. Yeah. And that's, so, and that's a big part of these that is, games, that is especially a, a game like Red Dead. Yep. What about things like transferability? Would you be able to uh, share a game or uh, trade in a game? Or if you wanted to play multiplayer with a friend who didn't also own the game, could you like loan them a slot or anything is there any talk of that kind of technology coming i don't remember if google's spoken about that yeah. what about it's, at it's least digital trade-ins i mean that's an easy one well the trade-ins i don't think I don't there think are they have there any are no programs. digital trade-ins i think yeah. that's the the negative of having these digital games is there's nothing to sell back right uh okay we're going to switch gears again real quick we only have a couple minutes left but michael brown is alerting us that rcs chat is here in the United States. Uh, Finally. Roger, do you have any yeah. feedback on this? Um, is it here today? It's not here like right now, right? I, I Apparently do, some people are getting it on their Pixel. Oh, wow. All right, yeah. So, I mean, look, I like, beyond um, beyond just getting it, I don't have much news on that. I know Google's been pushing this. Um, the carriers just last month announced a whole joint venture to work on RCS. This is so long overdue. And it's, it's yeah, nice it's totally to finally... long overdue. This is basically smart messaging, their way to combat uh, Apple's iMessage. Um, but we'll see how they work together because in terms of our conversations with Google and with the carriers, it doesn't seem like they're talking and you kind of want the carriers and Google all on the same page. So Not to mention that you are going to be dealing with a different platform. Yep at least from the, from the carrier side and from Google side, because what happens when you're sending a message to someone on an iPhone? Right, right. Do you now have to use a different app, or are they going to? how are they going to talk to one another because they're doing different technologies? Still a lot of questions about it, for sure. So, yeah. I mean, that's good that RCS is coming or is here in some, some limited form. It is long overdue. I've been hearing about RCS for, I don't know, at least five or six years. So. EDM days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Good on RCS. For those playing bingo, we mentioned BlackBerry Messenger. So <laughs> there, you, there you go. Uh, we are closing in quickly on Black Friday and Cyber Monday, for that matter. Uh, Eric's already finding some good Black Friday deals out there. I don't know what we got cooking on the CNET side of things, but we should probably get uh, Mr. Broida back on here soon. What do you think, Roger? I think that's a great idea. Uh, we've got we do have a lot of Black Friday content on the site. If you're looking for deals, we've already got the early ones on our site, so definitely check them out. Black Friday actually started in July. You're right. You're right. Basically, after Prime Day was over, Black Friday season began. Never ends. Um, and the United States yes. of Black Friday. And we've got no, but we do. There are a lot of deals, and we should definitely have Rick Breuer on very soon. Anything you're looking to buy? No. <laughs> Unless it's all baby related. All my all my purchases are baby related. So, sadly, yeah. Well, yeah. I need a new laptop, so if you guys uh, catch any good deals out there, let me know if you see anything. We will definitely do that. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, before we shut down today, uh, let's go ahead and speculate. Now that he's departing, what is John Ledger's next job going to be? We were just talking yeah, about that. Yeah, we were that. talking about that right before we went on uh, air. We know he's, a, he's big on uh, exercise and fitness. He's, you know, he's a runner. 
Um, so constantly is is periscoping and Facebook live. And he, he's sixty one, so he's not you know he's not at retirement age yet. So he's still. Like he's, he's, he's he said, said on, on the, the call, call he is not retiring. Yeah. So uh, he said he's not going to companies he hates. Is I believe how he put it. So that, uh, which knocks out AT and T and Verizon, which would make sense because telecom non competes are probably pretty strong. Right. Which probably rules out Dish as well. And, and although that would probably not make cable sense. Companies like Charter. And yeah. Yeah. Um, but you had an interesting theory, right? But yeah, uh, we were talking before. Peloton is a company that's currently trading below its IPO price. At right. Least before we went on air. Um, they, he likes fitness. They are a company Seems to that be a brand that would make the match with John, and he's talked about it. Has he? he well, with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, well, I mean, he's, he's a made, fan of He likes the service. That's that. That's all I talk. He didn't talk about the like working for the company. He just liked it as a as a service. Right. I I, I know he's tweeted about going to SoulCycle and, and right. doing those type right. of things. So that would make sense if he ends up there. Or Slow Cooker Sunday. He could just have he could just start a new show. There you go. I won't say where. <laughs> he, Next season on the Daily Charge, a brand <laughs> new host. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Yan says new Fitbit CEO. I think that's a great idea. Well, uh, we we thought about that. Except Fitbit's getting purchased he, by he Google. Can't go to Fitbit anymore because they're no longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fitbit. So they're, they're and, you know there's no there's no chance to cash out once the company's been purchased by Google. So yeah, that's true. Eh, you know, I th- th- that was the company that came to my mind too. Just. The Google thing kind of disqualifies us a little bit. Yeah, once yeah. you're once you're bought by Google, you're, yeah. you're kind of set up. You're not you're not going to do anything if you're joining Google if you're joining Fitbit now. So yeah, uh, my money is on an aspiring career as uh, Instagram's latest influencer. Oh, I mean, yeah, he would do amazing. He, I mean, he's already built up the following. He already ha- yeah, he has a following, so, so he very could true. very easily just start you know. And he is a wizard at Instagram stories. I was watching him work his Instagram magic at the uh, the Uncare event two weeks ago, and he's he is extremely savvy. He's savvier than I am. That'd be stuff. something if AT and T like sponsors a post on John Ledger's Instagram. <laughs> Ooh yeah, there you go. That's world's, his next world's career. Worlds colliding he's right an there. Instagram model. There you or go. Influencer. There you go. Well, if any of that happens, we'll make sure to uh, report on it here on The Daily Charge. But thanks, everybody, for joining (laughs) us. Uh, Great stories, great conversation. We'll see you again tomorrow, and Roger. All right. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you can join us here live weekday mornings. If you have the chance, check out the links below to learn more about today's topics, and feel free to subscribe to our audio podcasts that are on every platform ever. For The Daily Charge, I'm Roger Chang. And I'm Eli Blumenthal. Thanks for joining us. Can't get enough? Check out The Daily Supercharge, our extended post show with special features, audience Q&A, and in-depth reviews. Available now wherever you get your podcasts.